questions and answers. So anyway, welcome to the Harris Center. The Harris Center has been around for over 50 years. And throughout that time, we've worked really hard on helping to protect over 24,000 acres. Um, but the big piece of what the Harris Center does is really helping people connect to nature. We like to think of helping people fall in love and make a deep connection to this place in the Monadnock region. And we do that through protecting land, um, lots and lots of education from programs like this to working in schools and um, working with college kids. So we really try to do a lifespan approach to education. We also have a great program in conservation research and science. And many of you might be involved in the amazing salamander brigades. And we have Brett Amy Thielen here tonight. Um, and she's our salamander queen, which is great. Um, so the Harris Center works really hard. And if you're interested in finding out more about the Harris Center, you can always check us out online. So great. All right. So this is so exciting. Um, I am really thrilled to introduce our two presenters, Jeff Littleton, who is the manager and ecologist of Moosewood Ecological, which um, in this area, in this region is really the only place to go to if you wanna have a natural resource inventory done or you have questions about your own property. He's an incredible ecologist and naturalist. I love spending time in the field with Jeff, especially if it has to do with snakes and turtles because I know that's something that's really close to your heart, right, Jeff? Yes, <laughs> yes. It is. So, but tonight he's gonna to be talking about managing meadows um, and his um, compatriot is also one of his coworkers, Stephen Lamond, another wonderful and brilliant ecologist, a board member of the Harris Center. And um, really are, what I'd like to think of is Stephen um, gets us making sure that we're um, being community scientists. He's always helping us connect to eBird and iNaturalist and get the information of the things that we're seeing out in this world to scientists like himself who can make more sense of it than I might make sense of it. So it's my real pleasure tonight to have this program um, here at the Harris Center with Stephen and Jeff. And I'm going to say, take it away, you guys. All right. Susie, thank you so much for that most generous um <laughs> introduction and i appreciate working with you and brett and everyone else at the hair center it's always been such a great pleasure throughout gosh all these years i can't even count them at this point um and it's just a, a real pleasure to be here tonight so yeah, I'm Jeff Littleton. I'm the principal ecologist at Moosewood Ecological, just to repeat what Susie just said. <laughs> and um, I just, wow, I just feel very heart warmed. Thank you, Susie. Um, and so we're here to talk about field management. Um, so I also work at Antioch as adjunct faculty teaching about, just to give you guys a little bit of background behind us and who we are. Um, Steven's gonna introduce himself and, and give a whole load of like all the hats that he wears because we we like a lot of hats in Moosewood actually. So um, we uh, both work at Antioch. I teach about natural resource inventory techniques for wildlife and and uh, plants and talk about, uh, uh, teach about forest ecology and interpreting um, past land use histories. Um, also talking about uh, or teaching about land management, which we're going to go into this evening. So we appreciate the opportunity to hang out with you guys for about an hour and talk about some of the really fun stuff that we've been up to, stuff that we've been learning, and what we want to um, share with everyone. So having said that, I'd like to hand it over to my esteemed colleague, Stephen Lamond. Thanks, Jeff. Um, as he alluded to, I, I wear many hats. Uh, I work full time at Moosewood Ecological as a project manager and ecologist. Uh, some of you may have seen me around Antioch University, where I manage the spatial analysis lab and teach courses on uh, mapping, cartography, uh, and a lot of conservation planning. 
Uh, and then I also offer several courses and workshops and outings and hikes through the Harris Center, uh, as well as through Keene State College. Um, so happy to answer any questions relevant to documenting the, the biodiversity in your fields uh, towards the end of this presentation. I see some questions have already come in. Fantastic. Please keep them coming throughout the presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Stephen. So just a little bit more about who we are and don't want to bore you too much, but um, we really um, appreciate a collaborative effort in the work that we do. Um, we are um, an interdisciplinary team who works not only with other professionals, um, students who are learning like we used to be, and, um, but also landowners, because a lot of the folks that we work with uh, include landowners, and you know an awful lot about what's happening on your on your property, and we appreciate the collaboration and and better understanding through that. So um, that's sort of our model uh, moving forward, and has been. We've been working in this area for gosh twenty plus years, and have just enjoyed meeting everyone in all the organizations that we work with. So again, we're here to talk about managing meadows for wildlife. We have a lot to talk about. We could probably do this until the midnight hour. We're not going to. We're going to take about uh, 45 minutes of your time or an hour, um, but happy to um, entertain any questions as we move about through this presentation. So again, a little bit more background of what we do is a lot of conservation planning, and that means a, a lot of different levels, wh whether that's uh, parcel-based or community-based, town-based, uh, regionally-based. A, a lot of what we're gonna talk about tonight is gonna be land management and planning, habitat restoration, pollinator habitat development, um, which I'm gonna really touch on um, but we are big educators. That's one of the things that I really enjoy working with Stephen is that he is uh, really wonderful about educating the community. And I think we have a really good rapport with one another and, um, and just overall fun in our natural world. That's what we want to share with people, you know, each and every day um, as we're moving forward. So moving into our presentation now, thinking about um, management of fields, there's a lot of different questions that can come up um, in your mind if you have one or have been managing one and, and thinking about where should I go now or what should I do at this particular point is really trying to understand the idea of your goals and objectives. Are there specific wildlife that you're interested in? Uh, is there one species? Is there all species? Um, because we can think about this management in a, in a lot of different ways. And I like to keep it really open uh, with people. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities depending upon where your property may be uh, in terms of are you located in a extremely rural situation where you're just surrounded by woods and you have a field or are you sort of near some other agricultural areas or other fields or are you in an urban landscape maybe it really depends upon where you're situated and, and how you think about management, how, or how we think about management and also the different species that we're um, interested in stewarding. So are you interested in early successional habitat? Uh, Stephen's going to like get into a lot of this stuff with birds and mammals and stuff, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, uh, is it grasslands that you're really interested in? 
hay fields, which are managed systems, but we can manage them in different ways these days. And one of the things um, that we incorporate and what we think about on a daily basis is the New Hampshire Wildlife Action Plan, that they recognize that grasslands and shrubland habitats are a limited resource around here now. You know, if we're thinking about 100, 150 years ago, it's a definitely different landscape. Um, I'm not that old, so I didn't get to experience it at that point, but you know, we had a lot more open land. So a lot of our species that were, that are adapted to these particular types of habitats are limited on our landscape today. And it's not a negative thing, so to say, but there are certain species that are struggling a little bit, um, particularly some of our grassland birds. And again, Stephen will illuminate upon that. And so that, that gets to that habitat importance and the number, oh my gosh, the number of species that use these open habitats is well over 100 different species. Some of them are species of conservation concern, prairie warblers, uh, kestrels, uh, green snakes. Oh my gosh, we could, we could go on and on and we will tonight, I think. <laughs> um, but it's, I, I, I think we're at a, a, a particular point that a lot of people have these particular habitats and maybe not exactly sure what to do with them and how to, to manage them in, in, in a particular way. So understanding what we have out on our landscape is really important. So one of the things that we like to take is a big general approach. We want to take a, a look at the, that, that big landscape, as I mentioned just a moment ago. Where are we in this landscape? Like personally, I live in Chesterfield. I have a small place, a um, couple of acres, most of it's wooded, but I'm surrounded by a bunch of really, really cool grasslands. And so the way my wife and I go about managing our property is thinking of that bigger landscape. How can we incorporate this, the, this whole idea of the bigger landscape into what we're doing on our little place? Okay, so no matter how small the place you have, you can make a huge impact is my big picture. So also thinking about incorporating structural diversity into your landscape is really important. And again, it does really depend upon what you're um, interested in managing for. So if you're interested in, and I'm, I want to talk broadly here before we get really deep. So if you're interested in managing for grassland birds, um, structural diversity may not be as quite important in the middle of the field as opposed to the edge of the field. Um, so we always just want to think a lot bigger than the area in which we are really managing. And we encourage other folks to think along those lines. Personally, myself, I come from a background of landscape ecology. Doesn't mean landscaping. It means talking about the large landscape around us and thinking about conservation on a big scale. So that's where I kind of come from when I'm thinking about um, these particular projects. So what I'd like to move into now is a little bit talking about managing fields, meadows for pollinators, um, which has been a big thing um, for most wood ecological, especially over the past six, seven years at this particular point. We've done a lot of work with um, the Cheshire County Conservation District, working throughout the whole county here, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, a lot of private landowners, and we see a huge interest 
in helping people better manage their lands for these particular um, um, aspects. So the issues, bees. Everybody um, I'm sure has uh, been attuned or, or at least heard about um, issues that we're dealing with our, uh, our native bees, not, not our European honeybees, which there has been an awful lot of issues, um, but just bees in general. And I don't want to be doom and gloom here, but I got to throw out a couple of different <laughs> um, aspects here. You know, they pollinate 85% of our flowering plants. I mean, think about that. That's a huge, huge uh, piece of our picture that we're working with. Two thirds of the world crops, um, so many fruits and seeds for numerous wildlife. And we're not even talking about ourselves. We're talking about small mammals, bigger mammals, um, a variety of different species and how that really kind of plays into the whole big picture. Again, bees have been declining um, the past couple of decades, habitat loss, fragmentation, you know the story, pesticide use. And this guy, Al, um, puts it out pretty good here. And I had to put a couple things in, the, in parentheses here because I like to think of humans, not just man. Um, so, but, but, he, but he has a really good point. You know, we, we need this interconnectedness to, 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 to make everything happen because it's all a system. And once a system starts to kind of fall apart, then we have some issues, right? So I'll put it out pretty good there. And again, I like his hair. So, but the solution is us. We can do so many different things um, that I'm going to talk about and what Stephen is going to talk about that we can do on a small scale and a big scale, but yet we're here to talk about field management. And so there's a variety of different management um, strategies that we like to think about and that we work with. And again, it's that big picture, but there's a lot of intricate sort of pieces that come together here. And we're talking about developing an array, almost, a, almost an array of mess, if you, <laughs> if you must. Um, so um, I'm, I'm gonna talk about specifically a property that we've been managing here in um, Cheshire County since 2014, 235 acres. A really beautiful property. We have been working on that to develop, gosh, we have six plus acres of um, pollinator meadows that we've created over time. And it's been really amazing to see the change, the diversity, the abundance that has changed over time. We've been working with a really lovely person, Joan Milm who teaches down at uh, UMass, and I just got to give her a shout out because she's been helping us so much in understanding the diversity on this particular property, and she's amazed at what's been happening out there just by chance. You know, like we, 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 we developed this habitat, and, we, and we've been, uh, I guess, nurturing it in a way, but you never know what's going to happen in nature things will um, turn sometimes. But anyway, so the idea um, in terms of managing for pollinator habitat, particularly bees, but also butterflies and insects and beetles and, and the whole gamut is to provide a diversity of habitat. And everybody's heard that, right? You want diversity. And so providing brush piles, in your, in, next to your hay fields, uh, maybe cutting back the edges of your fields so you have more of a feathered edge, um, maybe girdling some trees um, so you have habitat for a variety of different bees, planting 
certain species such as um, rubus, which you really don't have to. You, your um, uh, blackberries and and raspberries and such, um, and elderberries. Those are really important for um, nesting bees that like to bore um, into these soft pithy species, as we call them, providing habitat for ground nesting bees in appropriate areas, so not always mulching everything um, around your landscape, and also providing a variety of different species throughout the season. One of our uh, limiting factors here in New England is early flowering uh, species. So we have uh, like our salix, our uh, willows, for instance, which are extremely important. And you may not think about how much our basswoods and our maples um, are, are important for uh, pollinators, but they're extremely important because they bloom really early. You know, Sunday, our, our leaves just like popped on our maples. I don't know if you guys all noticed that too, but this weekend things just really pop big time and the flowers were out way before that, but they are extremely important and you may not realize it. Even, in, even black locusts, um, which we have in our yard, which aren't so native to here, but becoming more native, um, but provide so much food source and so much habitat for a variety of different species. Um, so trees and shrubs, big deal. But as we move into, in terms of field management for pollinators, um, it's not really that hard. It does take a lot of work, uh, depending upon what your goals are. Um, but this is a field uh, in which we, we've been managing again since uh, 2014. And this place is so alive with bees and uh, beetles, uh, wasps, um, butterflies. It's really, really quite um, exquisite, I, I have to say. Um, and we did this, this was an acre um, out in Roxbury that we created. The, 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 the whole precedence behind this was a whole inventory technique that we took to try to learn what was out on this landscape. And it was also the landowners, um, their interest in expanding um, pollinator habitat. And so by having this field that was roughly, well, they own two acres, I think it was six acres altogether. Um, but we quickly realized um, that the opportunity that was on this particular site, and again, it's all really site specific. So I have to really, you know, preface that. Um, it's was that we had bobolinks out on this site and woodcock and grouse and chestnut sided warblers um, among a bunch of other species. And many of these are species of conservation concern. So we decided to expand the idea and, 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 and the physical area of this particular meadow into um, three and a half more acres of pollinator habitat, which is super rich in, in a variety of different floral resources, different types of flowers blooming all through the, throughout the different season, but then also early successional habitat, which has provided a ton of other like free flowers, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting once you cut an area, what pops up. Um, mullein is always going to pop up, <laughs> I guarantee that, but um, also your, your, your blackberries and your raspberries and these particular species that have that pithy stem that um, certain bees love to 
to Nasdaq, and it really increased the, the diversity of the site and the abundance of not only the pollinator resources, but also birds, um, which has been really interesting. And we've been really fortunate to be able to monitor um, these particular species over time. Um, and again, a shout back to Joan and all her work, knowing that um, we've increased this uh, abundant supply of pollinator habitat. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, it's just amazing to, to work with in collaboration with Joan and, and all sorts of individuals. So one of the things that landowners, as you might be thinking like, well, what do I need to learn? What do I need to do um, to, 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 to develop this type of habitat is really to understand your site con uh, conditions. What is your moisture regime? Uh, what is your um, solar gain? What is your wind exposure? Um, there's a lot of different characteristics and not that they're extremely limiting. Water is a, is a big limiting <laughs> um, a, a, a piece that, that you want to consider, but um, you really want to take in the, the whole environment is my whole point that I want to take. So site prep is really important. I'm happy to... Um, talk more about site prep, um, what does it take to actually transform um, maybe an old field into a pollinator habitat, if that's what you're interested in, but maybe you're interested in just kind of maintaining it um, in an open state and maybe for birds, uh, for the particular birds that you have on your landscape. Um, Having said that, I'd like to switch it over to uh, Stephen Lamont um, so he can talk about birds and mammals and happy to answer any questions that you may have. So depending on the size of your field, uh, you might have different animals approach your yard. Uh, these photos were taken over at Pitcher Mountain Farm uh, a couple of years ago uh, where we'd see many different kinds of mammals show up, especially in dawn and dusk. Uh, these fields were between five and, and 10 acres, which is a larger area. We also see a number of birds and pollinators visit these as well. Um, and so fields from an ecological perspective are, are fairly uncommon uh, in the New Hampshire landscape, particularly within the Monadnock region. Uh, and so a lot of mammals, we see porcupines, coyote, deer, and bear uh, in these images here, will come to fields as a uh, to utilize the different food resources that are there. So they can get plenty of food out in the woods, uh, but if they're missing certain things in their diet, uh, they might head towards the nearest patch of grass where they can find not only grass and other herbaceous material, but lots of insects as well. So thinking all the way back to third grade biology, you may have learned about food webs and food chains, and it's all connected as Jeff alluded to earlier. And so when it comes to a field, um, put yourself uh, put your put your microbe hat on and think about what's there in the soil. Is it nutrient rich or nutrient poor? And depending on those soil characteristics, you'll end up with different herbaceous plants or even smaller woody plants in your meadows. Those will then attract the next level of taxonomic groups, uh, birds, insects, other pollinators, uh, and so on. And then we go up and up in the food chain and the more complex food web. So if you want to attract black bears uh, or deer or coyote, work all the way down to the basic levels of the food chain and start there. And then gradually work your way up through that food web. Plants will grow. Oftentimes when we're planting a new pollinator patch, the first year after the planting is so-so, uh, but all the flowers really pop that second and even into the third year. Uh, so don't have high expectations the first or second year out uh, after initiating new habitat management for your field or meadow. Um, give it a couple of years before altering your management design. 
if you have a small yard like me, uh, one acre, half an acre, a quarter acre or less even, um, skip, the trip, skip the trip to the dump uh, in the fall or the spring with your cleanup materials. Instead, uh, you can build a brush pile. Uh, these provide shelter, food, uh, water, uh, and, and nest sites for not just birds, but mammals and insects, and multiple levels of that food web. Uh, and so if you have larger logs and sticks, place those on the bottom. They create nice open spaces uh, that are more sheltered. And then you can place your smaller sticks, uh, even grass or unwanted weeds on top of that pile. Uh, and that will provide uh, a layered sheltered space uh, for lots and lots of animals to take cover. Now, if you're a small mammal, and you want small mammals in your meadow, don't put the brush pile in the center of your field. Offset it closer to the edge so that they can run to the cover of the woods more easily before they're snatched by a kestrel or a red-tailed hawk. Now, if you don't want to encourage mice in your meadow or other small mammals, uh, then you can put the brush pile right in the center uh, of your field if you have room to spare, uh, and they're more likely to get eaten. Uh, if you're photographing red-tailed hawks, that's great. And they're more likely to come to a field where the brush pile is right centered in the middle of that field. So this is really easy to do. It saves you a trip to the dump, cuts down on your carbon footprint, um, and, and it's a great way to attract more wildlife and more biodiversity to your yard. Uh, while you're pulling that up, Jeff, um, George, I, I saw your comment of potential wild boar activity in the meadows. Uh, those are actually black bears. Uh, they'll dig into the soil, uh, pull back rows of soil, and, and eat grubs and other fun insects and arthropods uh, in the woods. There's a fun behavior that my fiance and I got to, got to watch. If you also have a smaller yard, um, and, and, you know, you're not an agricultural farmer, uh, you just have a small one acre, two, two acre yard or so. Um, one of the things I recommend to landowners is rotating your mowing. So you're leaving part of your lawn to grow up into tall grass. Yes, beware the ticks, but it's worth it for all the moths and butterflies that come to your yard. Uh, snakes as well, preferred lawns where the grass isn't cut super, super short. Uh, you can give your lawn mower a break and set the blade nice and high uh, so that if there are snakes in your lawn, they're not getting chopped to bits uh, by, by cutting the grass very low. Of course, you you still need to get get around your lawn and access different parts, different different gardens, other areas. Make sure you can refill the bird feeders safely, uh, and so cutting paths here and there, but leaving other parts of your yard uh, to to grow up into tall grass, uh, wildflowers. Uh, and those are really, really great attractants, uh, starting again at the base levels uh, with the microscopic animals and pollinators, and then going all the way up uh, the food chain. So one of the fun inventory methods that we've deployed uh, at Moosewood Ecological is something called a snake hotel. These were developed by herpetologist Jim Andrews over in the state of Vermont, um, where I got to witness them in the Champlain Valley where they were attracting uh, rat snakes and garter snakes and hognose snakes. And I thought, well, gosh, this would be such a great idea to bring over to New Hampshire. Uh, they're they're multi-level stories of, of wooden planks with spacers in between that gives critters room to, to crawl in there. And what this does is it imitates a wood pile. If you have a wood pile near your house, chances are you may have seen a snake crawling out of there when you went to go uh, grab firewood uh, in the fall. And so these, these are built purposely for snakes. They're covered with a dark black top so that they warm up during the day. Uh, and as we go around to different properties and different communities to inventory the ecological uh, resources and biodiversities, we'll often deploy some of these snake hotels. Uh, they're, they're multiple floors with a penthouse uh, for, for the bigger snakes. Uh, and it's great fun to, to see what swings by. There's an Eastern milk snake in the top, in the top right. And um, a rat snake, which is more common over in Vermont. Uh, and so these sort of sorts of features, if you don't have a wood burning stove, you can always build yourself a, a, a small snake hotel or snake motel if you don't have enough wood for a multiple story uh, uh, building uh, and put these out on the edges of, of your meadow so that they're, they're not in the way of mowing. Uh, if your neighbor owns a hay field, you could ask to put one of these in the corner. And uh, this just adds another bit of habitat, uh, another habitat resource for animals to use. We often see uh, ant colonies, spiders, mice will move into some of these from time to time. Uh, bees and wasps have been found in these 
these structures as well. Um, and the great thing about the snake hotel is that they're transportable. You can build them and then move them to a different location in another year. And they're really easy to check. If you have young kids and you want to uh, show them the, the local biodiversity in your own yards, you can deploy one of these snake hotels. We get a lot of questions about turtles, uh, not just snakes and, and birds and things that use meadows. And it all depends on the landscape context. What's nearby? Uh, I'll, I'll dwell on this a little bit more later on. Uh, but wood turtles are a species of conservation concern here in the Monadnock region and elsewhere in, in the Northeast. Um, they're often found near large winding rivers and they love to bask in sunny areas on the banks, especially near agricultural fields. This is one of the areas of uh, wildlife human conflict that we see, but it doesn't have to be a conflict. There can be a compromise. So not mowing um, or, or not mowing or haying all the way up to the riverbank, but leaving somewhat of a grassy buffer between the two uh, can help spare wildlife and also benefits uh, pollinators. Jeff mentioned this feathered edge idea where you're not mowing right up to the woodland edge. You're leaving a little bit of a buffer to grow wild and see, see what comes in there. And so it's not a, a stark contrast from the tall forest canopy to the low mowed grass right at the forest edge, introducing a little bit of a buffer. Uh, there, so that wildlife uh, it, it can can slowly approach the field if they're hunting, they're not being seen right away, or if animals need to dash for cover, they can hide in, in the blackberry or raspberry growth at the edges of those meadows. Birds are a hot topic for me and, and Phil and the Harris Center and a lot of people on this call probably. Uh, and so here are three species down below. I'll reveal their names in a second. Um, and so if you have large agricultural fields or large meadows that are conserved nearby, um, it's great to keep those in a meadow state. Without management uh, here in the Monadnock region, we don't have any natural prairie systems, we're not in the Midwest, these fields will eventually turn into forests. Uh, and we'd have to wave goodbye to the bobolink on the bottom left, the eastern meadowlark in the bottom center, and the savanna sparrow on the bottom right. These species would disappear without our meadows here in the Monadnock region. And so maintaining meadows, if you have that opportunity, uh, is a wonderful option to help preserve these species that are declining uh, throughout the granite state. Uh, savanna sparrows, they, they can handle smaller areas, smaller fields. If, you have, if you're fortunate enough to have bobolink or eastern meadowlark on your property, uh, they need usually at least five acres for bobolink, 10 acres or more for eastern meadowlark uh, is recommended. So maintaining the core of the meadow is really critical for these species. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the terms forest interior, think scarlet tanager, oven bird. A lot of bird species need the interior of the forest. Well, inversely, in the meadows, they like to be as far away from the forest as possible, right in the center of the meadows, and they'll avoid nesting on the edges of your field. So if you have a large field and you're thinking about converting half of it to early successional habitat, another declining habitat here in the Northeast, consider leaving it all meadow to benefit those birds that need these large contiguous tracts of open grassland in order to breed. If you have more of a wet meadow, uh, there's still a lot of opportunities there. Of course, it's harder to mow. Yeah, you don't want to drown your lawnmower, uh, but just let it grow up and, and see what happens. And then you can always rip out the invasives and put native plants in. Uh, we get a lot of questions about what to do with old trees. Of course, if they're right next to your house or a power line, it's probably a safer thing to cut them down or trim them at least. But if it's an old tree away from any structures, leave it up in the field. These provide great uh, perching sites for hunting raptors, as well as nest sites uh, for woodpeckers, tree swallows, American kestrels, uh, even wood ducks uh, and, and hooded mergansers will nest in large cavities and standing trees. And so leave up those old trees. Uh, when they eventually fall over, all of those nutrients are going to go back into the soil to support uh, native plants. And then the, the food web starts all over again. So leave those old trees up. They're great for a number of reasons. And I'd like to end my spiel uh, uh, and shout out to a, a new program that the Harris Center is starting to monitor American kestrels throughout southwestern New Hampshire. 
Um, we'll be, Phil Brown and I will be talking about this tomorrow night, followed by an infield uh, presentation at some point. Uh, and over the next couple of years, we hope to better study the American kestrel throughout the Monadnock region, learn which fields they're using and why, what fields, uh, which, what characteristics do those fields have in common, uh, and how can we support this declining species. So keep your eyes out for more news about this project and how you can get involved through the Harris Center. And Jeff, I'll turn it over to you to talk about some resources that are online for folks interested in managing their fields and funding opportunities to help pay for all that great management. It's just a basic question that um, was asked at the very beginning that maybe Stephen, you could respond to. The difference between a field and a meadow, please. Great question. As an ecologist, I've learned the best answer is always, it depends. <laughs> so it depends who you're talking to. In our sense, in our line of work, a field and a meadow are generally synonymous. You can use them interchangeably. Um, I have I took a quick minute to look up, see if there are definitions online. Fields are typically all herbaceous in some settings, whereas meadows could have some woody materials. They could have a, a snag out in the middle or some bushes here and there. Um, so it depends who you're talking to. For us, that we use them interchangeably. Absolutely. Thank you, Stephen. And um, sorry for a couple of issues that we're having here, or I'm having here, but there are, um, there's tons of resources that are out there for landowners to, to learn an awful lot more about management for fields, meadows, whatever we want to call them. And, and I, I'm assuming that this will be posted on Hair Center's site, but here's just a few. Natural Resource Conservation Service um, is a wonderful resource to learn more about the management of fields. Um, they have just tons of resources that are out there. And then, and then you can move on to the UNH Cooperative Extension um, site and they have an awful lot of resources that are available for you to better understand about the ecology, uh, particularly of your um, your meadow, your 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 field site, or potentially what could be there, uh, potentially what you'd want to manage for. Um, and then there's also the Xerxes Society. That's getting more towards the realm of the pollinator sort of side of everything. So, you know, these are just a, a, a quick list of resources that are available. And, you know, with our access to the web these days, you could go endless. You know, I, I was playing around earlier today and I was finding things everywhere. I wanted this to be a little bit more specific to New Hampshire. Um, but uh, there's, there's an amazing resource that is um, available that's out there, but these are some great sites to start with. Probably a lot of information <laughs> for you to sort of absorb. Funding opportunities, let's move into that for a moment. Um, there are a few... Um, funding opportunities that we're really familiar with. We do a lot of work with NRCS, so the Natural Resources Conservation Service. We do a lot of work with private landowners. Um, there are certain aspects that um, you need to uh, be eligible for, uh, for some of these uh, particular projects. It used to be gosh, uh, communities, uh, municipalities uh, were eligible for this. Now it's more uh, private landowners. Um, but there's an, uh, a, a particular resource called the EQIP Fund, the Environmental Quality Improvement Plan that um, we've worked with a lot of different uh, private landowners to do small projects, big projects, it's a, it, it's a way of helping to offset the cost. Once you sort of uh, get in with the NRCS and 
um, have this sort of extra level of uh, stewardship, you may be invited to a thing called the CSP program, um, which is uh, a conservation stewardship program um, that will or can provide a little bit extra funding for yourself. So the site that we manage in uh, here in Chester, uh, excuse me, in, in Chester County, um, we've been able to garner uh, some good funding to do um, uh, monarch habitat, um, other pollinator habitat, um, some of the, the, the early successional habitat management. So there is funding out there. You may have to work with it a little bit, but certainly recommend that you contact your county in our CS office. So each county has um, uh, an office to contact. Um, for those that live in Cheshire County, I got to give a shout out to the conservation district here in Cheshire County because they have a really great program uh, called the Conservation Opportunity Fund. And one of the really great pieces of this um, is that it helps to support landowners that have 25 acres or less, um, because typically for NRCS funding, 25 acres or less doesn't really fall within their realm. Um, but they have a, a, a wonderful program. It's an annual um, uh, funding program. It's always due in February. Um, and it's up to $1,500 for a variety of different um, wildlife habitat projects, not just pollinators. They've been doing a lot of that stuff just because, again, that's like the buzzword these days, right? Um, and, and what a lot of people are, are working on, but it includes a whole host of different types of wildlife habitat. So check out the conservation district here in Cheshire County. You can contact Amanda Littleton or Brene Bershon through their website, which is here. Moose plate grants, um, been looking at that a lot more lately. They've been offering up a little bit more grants uh, in terms of land management, in terms of field management, some pollinator stuff. Again, that's sort of the edgy thing right now. Um, so you might wanna check out their website, but they're really all over the place in terms of of their funding for wildlife habitat management. And a really good source is the New Hampshire Fish and Game Small Grants. There's tons of different types of habitat management um, that they can help out with. Um, so all these websites are right here for your pleasure um, to check them out. This is not comprehensive. Just wanted to give you folks just a, a, a bit of a taste of what's available out there um, in terms of helping to fund your wildlife management. Having said that, um, we'd like to move into Mrs. Wood Turtle here, who was from Nelson um, many, many years ago. I hope she's still around and uh, answer any questions that you may have. I know this, there's a bunch in the chat there, um, but um, certainly welcome to open it up. Uh, for any and all questions at this point, as we just gave a little taste of field management. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys so much. That was great. Um, lots of incredible questions, lots of great information you gave us. Um, loved it. So thank you. And there's a lot of questions around the topic of mowing. Um, I could kind of clump them all together, but really people are very curious about how often they should mow um, to manage their land for pollinators versus birds. And then there's some more specific questions regarding, you know, if you having a, um, if you're having like Maryland has a crab tree that keeps sending out seeds and then one area is just growing up all these crab tree saplings, you know, mowing them down, is that the right thing? So can you guys talk a little bit about mowing and managing your meadows through the mowing, when to mow, when not to mow? Well, it depends. So <laughs> usually with mowing, mowing is going to impact something. 
And so if you if you want bobolink, don't mow in the middle of the summer. Uh, if you want early pollinators, uh, don't mow first thing in the spring. So it really depends on what your end goals are. And then we could tailor a mowing scheme or schedule to that field. Uh, if your overall goal is enhancing biodiversity, um, Mowing certain sections of your field at different times of year or how often uh, will could, could be an interesting study for that. And that would help maximize biodiversity. So there's no one rule fits all. It all depends on what your goals are. Jeff, perhaps you can speak more directly to the crab apple tree issue. Just to build on a little bit of what you're talking about, uh, Stephen, um, there is no one size fits all. It really depends upon what you're trying to manage for. Um, typically, when you're talking about uh, pollinators, you're looking at it would be good to maybe only mow a third of your field during any given season. And what that provides for, it's, it, it's like if you think about managing a forest in a way, um, it's the same thing, just a, a different habitat. So if you only mow a third of it, that means you're mowing that particular part down and you're creating this other um, uh, structural diversity for goldfinches, maybe like later in the season and other birds that are moving through as well as small mammals that are feeding on all the seeds. So if you only mow a third, you're providing two thirds of habitat that's different for a particular area. Um, the crab apple thing, yeah, don't have a whole lot of experience with that um, necessarily. If you're thinking about managing woody species, um, uh, an appropriate method would be to mow it down and, unless you wanted to use chemicals. Um, but mowing it definitely would help keep it at bay. That's uh, a typical response, uh, management response to um, invasive species if you're not um, uh, physically pulling them out of the ground and just trying to keep them at bay from going to seed. So that would be my first thought, I guess, on, on that. Great. So here's another part of a question related to mowing. Um, and this is from Paul. He says, uh, how to resolve creating habitat for wildlife um, and safety from deer ticks? How do you resolve that or any suggestions? Well, I think deer ticks are here to stay. Uh, they're not going to yeah. go away with the warming climate. Uh, and so uh, the best thing you can do is just get used to doing a tick check every time you come inside. Um, things will eat ticks, uh, and it's unfortunate that we have so many, especially with the dry springs we had last year and, and hopefully not too dry this spring. Um, but hopefully try not to worry too much about the ticks and focus on all the biodiversity that you can bring to your yard with those tall grasses. Jeff? No, that, that, that's true. That's a, that's a great point, Stephen. Um, obviously, there is a big concern about ticks. Um, I think we all think about that on a, a regular basis. Um, for folks like us that work outside all the time, you know, we're constantly looking at doing a tick check. I mean, I do it like every 10 to 15 minutes as I'm walking around in the field. I'm looking down at my pants and everything. And it's just a, a, a product of, of where we live now and the environment, like Stephen was talking about. Around your house, there's a lot of things you can do. We have chickens, and they do a really good job of eating ticks in your yard or guinea fowl. Um, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of different uh, ways you can manage around your house. But when you're talking about a field, um, it's really difficult to, to, to manage for those ticks. For instance, um, I'll share a story. I was over working at Joppa Hill in Bedford many, many years ago, Bedford, New Hampshire. Beautiful place, wonderful place. 
by the time I got in my truck, I pulled the 51st tick off of me on one day. So we just have to learn to live with it and just pay attention to ourselves, I think. <laughs> Well said, well said. And right now, everybody is probably doing a tick check as, <laughs> as they talk. Okay, so um, here's a, just a couple more questions. I mean, we could go on, but I, I'm keeping an eye on the time. And so I think this, um, I have two questions that I'm going to combine into one and then one last question. And this, the question, um, Miles and Jim are kind of asking a similar question about any management to repel specific species. So for instance, Jim is curious about deer resistant meadow plantings. Deer resistant meadow planting. So yeah, deer are quite the concern when it comes to managing um, meadows because they are voracious, they're hungry, they're out there, they're eating as much as they can. Um, there are a variety of different deer resistant plants that are available. A lot of them are non-native um, and maybe that's the reason why the deer don't like them so much. When establishing shrubs and, 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 and I'm thinking about this and a couple different sites that, that we have established shrubs, we're putting like netting around them to prevent the deer. And it's just really tough. We have a strong deer population here, um, obviously. And um, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a tough subject to deal with. It's also uh, for just regular forest management. When, when, when you go in and, and cut a particular area and then you have um, um, uh, saplings regenerating, you have deer and, and hopefully moose um, moving into the area that um, are consuming um, these particular species and, and they're adapted for that particularly, you know, um, so that, that's a tough subject. I, I, I don't have a, I don't have an easy answer. Sorry. I wish I did. Um, I've been struggling with it for 20 years working with landowners and it's, it's, it's hit or miss. All right. Well, that's, that's good. Um, here's the last question for tonight. Um, and this is from Lindsay who just bought a home on three acres and she says the land is mostly open. Um, and she wants to turn the back half into a wildflower area. And she's thinking of goldenrod and aster, but she's curious if you have any advice on how to get it started to ensure its success so that new flowers stand a chance to, against the current um, grasses and weeds that are already there. And I think that's a, a really good question to end on because some people might have meadows that they want and fields that they want to put some more pollinator or tractors in and any suggestions on, on how we can do that without, without just planting stuff and it just disappearing into the grass and meadow? Yeah, um, that, that is a great question. Um, so there's a couple of different techniques. Um, I will first and foremost say um, check out Xerces organization, but there's some really great techniques that um, we've been employing on a variety of different sites um, that look at, um, it takes some time, but plowing and multiple plantings to help suppress um, the, the, the weed pressure um, that's on there in order to get the particular species that you're interested in planting. And once those are set, um, you're pretty good to go for a while, but your grasses are definitely going to creep in. Um, I'm not going to pretend that's not going to happen. Um, um, but there's um, multiple ways of going about the process, but it takes about a year. And after you sort of prep the site up for a year, um, maybe using like uh, rye or oats as cover crops, to help smother, it's called smother cropping, um, uh, which is a, a 
technique that, that we use, which is organic. Uh, so it doesn't involve chemicals, um, but it definitely involves uh, machinery to get out on site. Um, but then you do a, a, a frost planting, uh, particularly I love to go out in November, particularly right before uh, a snowstorm, if we have them at that, at, at that point. Um, would really help out. So, so backing up a little bit, the most important thing is uh, your, your, your prep site, making sure that you supply um, adequate seed to soil contact. So um, the more work that you put into it in the beginning, the better you're going to um, end up with what you want to want to see later and you know the the the, the sites that that we've planted we're talking gosh seven years we don't mow anything you know we don't manage it really we we did the the, the we did really good at prep work which does again take a lot of time but when you put that energy forth um you gain a lot of benefits later out of the whole process. Um, you can always use plugs, which are really cheap, um, which are um, um, like small plants for those that don't know plugs. So you can go to your regular nursery, you know, and buy a 15 to $25 plant, but you can also find these plugs for Two dollars each, and and then plant, and so that kind of kickstarts things um, really quickly. But you got to watch out for deer. <laughs> of course, of course. Stephen, do you have anything you want to add? No. Well okay. said, Jeff. Yeah, well said. Um, I want to thank both Stephen and Jeff for this evening. So much great information. And I want to thank all of you who showed up tonight and um, look forward to seeing some really great meadows being managed. I'll just put one last plug in. Um, the Harris Center is really excited about No Mow May. So um, we're asking people to not mow their lawns for the month of May. That gives the pollinators a chance to stack up, uh, stock up on what they need to get their self started for this um, summer. So consider No Mow May and you can read more about it at our website. We have a little write up about it. And um, if you have a little front lawn or back lawn, whatever, don't mow. Stephen's giving me a thumbs up. I hope I don't get kicked out of my neighborhood for not mowing, but I don't really care. Uh, I've got reason. Um, so thanks. Thanks all of you. And again, Stephen and Jeff, that was so interesting and really well presented. 